Let me welcome everybody to this month's Mother of All Demo Days meeting. I'm excited to share that we're stacked today uh, with six demos from Consensus Lab, CryptoNet, ProBlab, Lotus, and PhilDev teams. Lukash, you can go first. Yeah, this is a data explorer. And what it lets, what it makes it possible to do is like you can go and see miners and, and that are present in the market actor. Uh, it like shows you which ones it can connect to. At, Shows you which ones it cannot connect to. Yeah, when you when you click on a miner, it shows you the list of deals in, in a not so pretty way for now. Uh, but uh you know, it can you can look at deals. Um you can click on a deal and it makes a retrieval, and that's quick. Uh and it shows some summary. So like this is a directory. Let's go to this deal. Yeah, like if you if you have a directory, you can like look what's in it. And it's it's a you know one one you know subdirectory. So like let's let's go see what is stored on Falcon. So it's an image of some some error photo, like a different image. And it's like every single you know click is a retrieval that that works. Um, also, those images are loaded, just like they're streaming straight from GraphSync. Uh, so, I guess on some in images you may be able to see uh, that they load from like top to bottom. Uh, that is streaming from GraphSync straight into the browser. Um, I'm not sure if that comes through on Zoom. It has fairly low latency, um, but yeah, okay. So other things uh, this can do, you can like, you, this is this is just a Unix FS directory, uh, but you might sometimes want to see the like IPLD view of it. So this is just dumping the internal Go IPLD prime uh, node representation. And yeah, it's just, just a tag PB node. Uh, and yeah, I guess we we have more interesting DAC PB nodes. So like this example, it's like some DAC Cbor thing in a directory. So let's see, this is some Cbor NFT horse, um, apparently. Um, so yeah, like it has some image, some metadata, and and yeah, we can we can look at an NFT horse. It, it's a horse. Um, <laughs> So yeah, uh, some IPOD data, uh, other things it can do, it can like, oh yeah, so so the thing with uh, streaming data is when you have a larger file, so like this 256 meg thing, uh, when you start downloading it, uh, it's maybe very small, uh, but you can like see that as it's getting blocks from GraphSync, uh, they go straight into whatever. And it's actually like decently fast, especially given what inter internet I'm on right now. That works. Other, other cool things. So if you, you know, sometimes when IPOD data, especially CBOR is stored on Filecoin, uh, it's stored as raw blocks. So, they would appear as just a file because uh, it's in raw block and and just some random hex. So when you when you open that in the IPLD view, it it's just some random hex which doesn't make sense. But uh, when the explorer picks it up as Cbor, uh, you can view it as Cbor. Um, and as it turns out, in this case, it is uh, the AMT of sectors uh, in, in minor state on Falcon. So uh, someone start Falcon state on Falcon, which is neat. Uh, and you can go through it. And like when you see a CAD, uh, if if that block store was stored as a raw block uh, in some Falcon deal, uh, it, it's not necessarily the, the links in that block uh, will not necessarily be in the same deal. So if I try to open a link in, in the deal that was in a row block, uh, that will not work. 
but we now have you know, global network indexers, and those are nice. So I can click on find, and I can find that CAD in a different deal. And I can go there and continue my adventure exploring, you know, the, the APLD data that I was looking at. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's basically all this can do. Uh, oh, it can also, you can also look at this same data on IPFS. So it doesn't need to be uh, on Falcoin. And from this find page, uh, the top links go to IPFS. Uh, they just have a tendency to not work uh, because right now, for whatever reason, the uh, web free storage uh, references from indexers are not able to connect to them as maybe some updated provider entry. Uh, not, not sure yet exactly what's going on there. Well, Falcon miners are not providing bits of retrieval, so IPFS cannot fetch from them. Uh, but some of the time it works. Um, and yeah, this, this data explorer is very work in progress, uh, just a branch in Lotus. Uh, there's the PR9382. And it does have some instructions on how to run it. Uh, you just need a Lotus or Lotus Light node, uh, which is very easy to set up and very, you know, light. Uh, and you just like run those steps. And you can you can also explore the network. That's it. And wow, that worked. Thank you so much for presenting your demo. And we're gonna move on next to Will's recording with um Uptime checker. This is Willis from uh, Consensus Lab. Today I'll be showing you our uptime checker. In short, it is a liveness registry that is deployed on FEN. FEN. So uh, the first question from me will be wondering is, uh, what is uptime checker and uh, what does it do actually? So to answer that question, imagine we have a bunch of like uh, nodes uh, that's running in that decentralized network. For now, let's just say in the case of Saturn, and we have a, like a global distributed CDN, and these are the CDN that's running in the in the network. Uh, imagine a user wants to fetch some information from nodes, you just reach uh, ping one of the nodes, uh, but then what if one of the nodes is down? How does a user know whether a node is up or down? And what's the, for example, what's the fastest node in the network uh, that's near me? So in this case, uh, this is exactly what uptime trigger is for. So it, it tells users like which nodes are active or alive and what is the latency of a particular node. At the same time, uh, are the uh, metrics uh, above actually up to date? So this, uh, these are the core questions that the uptime trigger is trying to answer. We have, in this case, we have member, uh, what we call member nodes. So they are just a node running a certain common application or certain protocol across the network. And uh, of course, then we will have uh, what we call checkers. So they are just constantly going through a list of members to be checked, like periodically just ping them and to see if they are up and down and to see the network latency uh, for this uh, nodes. At the same time, once uh, it gathers the, the, the ping information, you will perform like, for example, liveness report and uh, show the last last check time time to, to show the recency and also to show the latency uh, of that node in the network. And finally, the checkers also cross check each other. That means if, if one of the uh, checker is down and then that checker can potentially be removed from the list of checkers. So we know all the checkers are actually alive. So in this case, checkers check members and also it checks it, check themselves. Uh, in terms of system architecture, uh, we have the uh, uptime actor. So here, this this uptime actor, which is a Rust implemented compiled to Bosom, it's running on the deployed on FVM. It does the registry like CRUD of the uh, checkers and members. At the same time, it also tracks the uh, reported uh, checkers that, that basically the checkers that are reported to be down. Uh, also, we have the member nodes. These are the uh, nodes that participating in a certain protocol, and uh, we are actually using the P2P uh, to uh, to do the ping. And uh, finally, we have the checker. This one uh, is actually Go, Go implemented and uh, it's Lotus based. What they do is they expose some endpoints 
and that uh, others can query to get the result of the uh, member node uh, information. At the same time, they also cross-check each other. So as you see here, and once uh, if some checker is reported down, right, they will, uh, the, the other checkers will start to report to uptime actor. And if a quorum or like a two third of the checkers reported a particular checker to be down, then that checker would be removed, automatically removed from the uptime actor. This is the high level or overview of the system architecture or in terms of the function. So later for the demo, uh, the architecture is, is a simplified version where we have four checkers and uh, we have two nodes so they are all lotus based and we only have one minor though so it's, it's not drawn uh, just to for the sake of uh, simplicity so these two member node form a lo local network and uh, they will also have one uptime uh, actor that's deployed within this uh, local uh, network without further ado i'll show you the the, the demo now let's see uh, our code setup so I do the kind of time constraint. Well, I have already set up the nodes plus the checkers. So uh, in order to see the whole end-to-end -end with the setup, uh, we refer you to the next uh, to the previous uh, another video. Uh, but for this one, uh, we have node zero and one already running. At the same time, we have four checkers. And from here, you can see node zero is actually running both the minor plus the uh, node itself. And we also have node one, which is actually just running the node and is connected to node zero. Okay, uh, what's uh, very interesting is to check the bunch of the checkers. So currently we're at checker zero. So, and here is uh, logging, constant logging the list of checkers that's currently registered with the actor. And uh, the, the checker is actually the actor IDs of uh, those uh, registered checkers. And uh, 1001, 1001 should be referred to uh, checker zero, and the 1002 should be referring to checker one. And so on and so forth. So uh, later, what I'll show you is uh, basically kill off the nodes, and we should be able to see the keeping responses. And uh, and the probably what's interesting is to show you uh, just take the, the commands that we spin up. So uh, these are the commands that we use to spin up the triggers. And for example, you can see one is zero, uh, and one index zero. Uh, Basically, just tell us that which uh, wallet to use. We have an uptime checker, and this is the actor address. And uh, this parameter is checker port. So, this is where the P2P port uh, is. At the same time, we also have the node info port. So, if you call, or oh, oh, currently is HTTP. So, if you call, query this port, you will be able to get the uptime info of the nodes. So, let's do this, log your host. One because we're running everything the same, it's the same local network. So you see here we have the key is basically the actor ID and is referring to this multi address. And there will be the up. So this is actually the node zero and the, the is online is true. So let's just focus on is online parameter, but the rest we are still turning it. And uh, this is actually saying, okay, uh, this node is up. At the same time, we also have the second node and is also up. So let's just query another one. It should give us the same result. So uh, yeah, no zero uh, and one. Both status is up. And this one should, yeah, is also up. So if you query no four and no three, no four, it, it should give you the same result. So the time is secret time, I'm not gonna show it. So what, so this should, uh, ideally is the happy path or sort of like a happy path where everything's running. Now let's just kill all uh the person the person so uh in that okay, this is toggle and uh okay let's just control c and okay this is this node is killed ideally i can see what's the log okay from the log you can see it just constantly trying to ping those multi-address uh of the, the register second node and node basic node dash one and it just cannot and it's just it's just throwing an error so in this case, uh, if we just try to uh, go, yeah, you can see the status is actually forced. So it's just saying this one, this for this node, this uh, address, monthly address is not out. So and uh, and uh, just check another one. 
yeah, it's, it's also telling us it's, it's, it's down. So then now what's more interesting, probably just try just try to kill off any of the shippers because they're constantly cross checking each other. I just try to kill off anyone. Um, okay, is it kill? Is it kill? Who knows? Okay, now it's kill off. So, uh, okay, this is my interaction ID 1002. So from here, uh, let's just check out uh, this one. Okay, so you see in the law, it's saying actor ID 1002 is down and you just cannot connect to both the node plus another checker. So after a while, I think currently this is doing the voting. After a while, and both of the, the rest of the all node, like for example, checker number two, uh, checker dash two is also seeing this uh, being reported. So uh, after a while, like when the message is uh, is resolved or executed, uh, then yeah, yeah, see here, the response gets back. So the list of checkers register any actor actually reduced by one because the one zero two is actually down. So uh, so that means the system is actually working now. With this, uh, I'll conclude my demo. And uh, because of time, we cannot show you the whole setup. But I refer to you if you're interested. Feel free, feel free to check out our repos and our other demo videos uh, for the whole setup. So thank you. All right. We'll move on to Irene. I'm Irene from from CryptoNet. And I'm going to talk about two projects. The first one is the Web3 storage bounty contract. So what is it? So we all know, I think, Web3 storage is these amazing tools that allow you to store files um, on IPFS and, 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 and Filecoin in a very easy way. And the way you do it, the way you access this, uh, this service is just you drop your file uh, to them via the uh, website interface. So how our goal is to make this tool accessible from uh, any EVM compatible blockchain, for example, Ethereum or, or, or others. So something that is now from a blockchain, you store directly to Filecoin and IPFS passing by Web3 storage. Um, uh, this is, you know, a nice addition on Web3 storage, uh, features that uh, users can play with. And also with, for us, for CryptoNet, it's a very nice way to test uh, the general idea of bounty contracts. A bounty contract are, pr are protocols where the users can just place bounties to the service of store this file, to store the file that is, uh, 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 that is uh, linked with this hash. And any, you know, uh, storage deals we like to call can, can uh, activate and, and provide the service and then claim the bounty. So we do this specifically for a Web3 storage as a dealer. And how we do it is simple. Uh, basically, we have designed a, storage, a smart contract uh, that has three simple functions. The first one is create a deal proposal where the, that is used by clients that want to store a file. So, and basically this is allowed to create this proposal of I'm going to pay this bounty to anyone that will, uh, that will take this file and store it on Filecoin, for example, IPFS. A step deal proposal is uh, for the dealer, and in this case, it's specifically for the Web3 storage dealer that check if the file is available, if it can access the file that was uh, uh, for which the proposal was made, and if it can access it and all other parameters. So the, the proposal con can contain other parameters, like, for example, the payment, the bounty, or duration, and other, other uh, storage features, let's say. If all these are, are fine, it'll accept the deal. Uh, so now we say that there is a deal active between the, the, the client and a Web3 storage dealer and we'll activate the, 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 the Web3 storage service and storing with uh, Filecoin providers and, and, and IPFS doing the, 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 the usual service, the, the, the service that is already providing. And and then and, and and this is like the deal is active, this, the file is storage. We have a last functions that we call claim bounty. That here is uh, not uh, that 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 that's one that the dealer can call to get the bounty. So he needs to have some proof of storage that the storage was successful. And once that this is done, he can claim the bounty. Actually, right now we are not using this in the uh, test in the, in the test version that we have because the, the payment, the bounty is uh, set to zero, so it's not really needed. But 
Um, here you can see, like, like, like the, 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 this app is, uh, the, the smart contract is uh, deployed on uh, garlic testnet, and we have an app for clients that you can test if you scan the QR code. There is a small video here uh, that show you how it goes. You basically uh, just drop your file, sign the transaction that is made by create the proposal uh, with the MetaMask, for example. And when the proposal is online, you get a notification. And when the Web3 dealer, you, uh, the Web3, the Web3 storage dealer accept, you get another notification. And now at the end, you just have this nice link where you can retrieve uh, the file. Uh, if you can, can check and retrieve the file. Here is actually, we are still waiting for the confirmation from Web3. This confirmation usually takes a, a few, few seconds because Web3 storage is, you know, downloading the file and activating the, 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 the storage deals with Filecoin provider, uh, uploading to the IPFS node. So there is, you, only, you usually need some time. Yeah, you can click on the link. The link show you the file, waiting for the confirmation. And when the confirmations arrive, you can also go back to your homepage of the app where all the deals are there with details of when you made the deals, uh, for how long is active, and this link where you can uh, you can still uh, uh, check uh, um, the file. Uh, okay, I think this is starting again, so I'll stop uh, for this one and I'll go to the next project that is the retrieval pinning protocol. Um, okay, so in this case, what we want, what we wanted to do is to, uh, what we wanted to do is to focus on how we can guarantee um, retrieval from uh, for, for files that are stored on a decentralized storage network, and in particular, of course, our use case is Filecoin. Um, and we designed this retrieval pinning protocol where, first of all, we have a fixed set of referees. So there is a network in the, in the implementation and now there's only five referees, and, but you can have any numbers, and we need to trust only three of them. So it's like this honest um, uh, majority assumption. You don't need to trust all of them. And then again, we design around this a protocol uh, where the client and the storage they make some deal for specific for the retrievability for the retrievability features. Uh, so the client will propose uh, as as in a similar way as you see in the other proto, in the other project, a, a deal with like uh, um, some specific parameters, not just the data, uh, data the, the, the dash of the data, but also the duration for which the retrieval uh, feature has to be guaranteed, the payment for the service, and very important, the collateral. So the collateral is some tokens that the provider put down, locked down in the contract, if he agrees to provide this service. When if the provider fails to provide this service, the retrieval, the retrieval service, what the clients now can do can appeal to ref, the referees that we have seen before. The referees have this role that they try again to retrieve the file, so they contact the provider and check if the provider is really was just a mistake or is really not providing the service. And if the retrieval works this second time, thanks to the, the help of the referees. We are all happy and the provider gets back his collateral and the payment for the service. If something uh, uh, goes wrong, what is will happen is that uh, the, the, the collateral is burned and the provider will lose it completely. Will go, the, the, the provider will go to the uh, smart contract vault. Um, again, we have the app live. The smart contract is on uh, Ethereum testnet, uh, the garlic one, and we have the app uh, that you can test uh, if you log in in the app as a client. This is what you basically see. Uh, you see this interface uh, where, again, you can start creating these receivability deals and you can drop your file here uh, very easily for the file for, 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 for which you want to do the retrieval deal. You can choose the providers. So in this case, it's not like, in, in the other case, basically, this was not this step because it was only Web3 uh, storage, the, 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 
the provider the details for which you talk but in this case we are we, you can choose which one. Uh, we have a Web3, we are in a doc provider that uh, we, we, a doc node that we maintain. Um, and you can choose, there are more parameters here about uh, if you want to have collateral or not. Of course, without collateral, it's like uh, less, less secure. Uh, for how long you want this, uh, this deal, one week, one, uh, one month. So this is all the, 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 the parameters that you can choose. And of course, when you go and create a deal, this will ask you to connect to your MetaMask and sign the, trans the transaction. The transaction goes online. The providers will uh, see the, the this request uh, can as to sign uh, use the accept deal proposal to sign uh, that is accepting the, the retrievability deals and from that moment we have a deal active when the deal is active if any points you as a client uh, you have some problem about the retrieval service you can complain uh, so you can go here and this means you can request an appeal as you see here uh, request and appeals will activate the referees, uh, the referee network that will contact the provider again and try to, as we said before, try for retrieval. Um, and basically, you can check everything. Uh, you can check the status of the retrievability deal. For example, if there is an appeal that is active, you can check what is happening uh, uh, while the referee network tries to recover the file for you, you can check it uh, in the app as well. Um, uh, on the other side, on the provider, uh, there is not like uh, the, 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 the interface is done by a command line. Um, there we have like all the code in our GitHub repo, repo. You can download and actually you can test and try. There is a readme. Uh, doc there um, actually really uh, would we will love to have feedback from also the provider side so if you're interested if you think it is nice go there and, and, and try to play with this um, here what you can see is an example of the common line of what the client sees uh, sorry the provider sees when he accepts uh, the a, a proposal a deal proposal um, and in general, I have to say that this is basically done. Uh, so the provider has to sign up to our protocol and while sign up, he can also choose uh, some default values for, uh, um, that, uh, for, for, for the deals that he wants to accept. So like a minimum payment, a maximum collateral, max duration, max size of the file. There is this. Uh, um, um parameters that you can accept you can uh, the provider can from common line uh, uh, decide of course we have the default values but any provider can choose um, and what is happening here is that uh, basically uh, almost automatically then these when you have these the parameters the the parameters that are in the deal are compared with this one and if everything they match the, the the proposal this is accepted otherwise no um what else about uh, about providers is that we are actually this is not yet uh, completely deployed but the theory for this is ready and we want to provide a reputation score so we are doing all this not just to put a crypto economic incentive uh, for for providing retrieval but we think it's also Will be very nice if we can add a reputation incentive. So we want to provide a way to say which providers are doing well uh, and which are not in the provide at least for retrievability for looking at the retrievability. And we designed the reputation code that has two components. Um, the, the first one has the the goal of incentivize provider that are willing to put high volume of of collateral. So the more collateral that you accept meaning meaning that you are more secure that you can provide a good a good service and the second component is actually instead of giving a, a higher score or incentivized provider that are taking many uh, deals meaning they can provide the retrieval in a, in a in a good way for you know uh, large large files or actually many files um, and that's it uh, please go and test. We are really looking for 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 feedback from clients and provider uh, sites. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Irene. 
Um, up next, we have uh, Dennis, uh, whenever you're ready. So hi. Um, we as ProBlab had a look at the Hydra boosters in the last couple of days. And yeah, in this quick demo, I want to show or yeah present some of the results that we got from our measurements. So for everyone who's not that familiar with Hydra boosters, Hydra boosters um, attempt to cover the whole hash space in the, in the DHT so that every time you provide something to the network, you hit one Hydra booster. And so that if anyone else tries to retrieve that CID, will also hit a Hydra booster and uh, gets is this content or the, the provider record uh, much faster than uh, if it was uh, without those Hydras. And so, as I said, the Hydras um, attempt to cover the whole hash space. And so we just, um, yeah, at, at first we wanted to, to verify this uh, proposition here. The first thing that we uh, took a look at is if there's actually a uniform distribution of ha um, hash, um, hash, uh, sorry, Hydra hats. And in this graph, we can see that's the case. So it's, it should be a, a straight line. And uh, yeah, well, that's the case. And the other thing is, um, is a Hydra head actually in the proximity of the 20 closest peers for every every peer we can find in the network? And for that, we took um, full network crawls um, from, from Nebula, then put all of those peer IDs in a binary try and uh, calculated for each peer ID in the network, the 20 closest peers, and checked whether a Hydra head is actually inside the proximity of these 20 closest peers. And the results um, show that it's actually the case. So in this particular example, we had around 16,200 peers in the DHT. And for 15,000 CS 700, um, there was actually a Hydra head close by, which makes up more than 97% coverage of the whole uh, of the whole hash space. And so this gives us an excellent advantage into the network. Um, yeah, just a reminder, the provider record consists of a CID, TTL, and a provider, um, a multi-hash. And also those um, <laughs> Hydra boosters have peer records, so in, in memory. And what we can do now is we can take all the provider records that the Hydras know of and correlate um, the providers with their uh, multi addresses and in turn the um, geolocation from the IP addresses. So we can actually tell where on the uh, in the world the CIDs actually reside. Um, since I'm short on time, I think I will skip the architecture. And um, so maybe just some general information. And the Hydra boosters know uh, of around 1 billion CIDs each day, 1 billion unique CIDs. So this is on the x-axis in the days of the last week. And what we can see here is um, if we take the set intersection between two days, we see that only around 500 million CIDs actually uh, intersect here, which means that in each day, around 50% of all CIDs churn and leave the network. And if we assume that a CID covers around 256 kilobytes of worth of data, this means every day 120 terabytes leave the, data, uh, leave the network, but also um, join the network again. And so this is just the CID churn graph is just another um, representation of exactly that. And um, what we can do is check um, which are the top providers. So here we can see um, which peer IDs actually um, provide how many CIDs. And if we just take a look at the top provider here, this is just one peer in the network. And this one peer provides around 13% of all CIDs um, of the whole network. And this goes down, This the next one is nine, around 9%, 7%, and so on. And so um, what we wanted to do now is actually find out who those peers are. And for that, um, well, we I, I thought these are maybe gateways or large pinning services and so on. And so we developed a tiny tool that's called uh, Antares that you can see here, um, which is just a tool that sits there. It's a lip to peer host. It provides content to the network and then requests that content through a gateway or through a pinning service and then just tracks which peer ID actually requested this content. And uh, I forgot to say, say this content is random and so no one else should know about it. And so if others request that content, we can track um, which peer IDs belong to which services. And um, 
well, I'm running out of time, otherwise I would have show, shown you that. Um, but it turns out none of the, well, I, I checked it with Infura and with Pinata, none of them um, correspond to these large pinning services. And uh, also it's not, not no gateways um, or so on. And uh, so, but I'm leaving it running, maybe I will discover uh, some of them. And maybe just one last thing, um, if we take it, as I said, we can correlate CIDs or provider records with provider records with peer records, and then in turn with the geolocation, um, we can have this country distribution that I told you uh, about. And we see that more than 50% of all CIDs can be associated, associated with, this, with the US and then the Netherlands and France. So these are all uh, also quite uh, interesting results in my opinion. And uh, yeah, we are also looking at the, the dependence um, of, for, for content retrievals and con content publications. And uh, right now we are running experiments um, where we exclude Hydras from content retrievals and uh, content uh, publications and just check how the, um, how the performance differs there. And um, yes, so these will be the next steps. Thank you so much, Dennis. Right, we have next um, from Veldev, Zach. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Zach Ayush. I'm a developer advocate with the FVM team specifically. Um, and so today we're going to be deploying a uh, actor or if you're from like the Ethereum ecosystem, um, smart contract to the uh, Wallaby testnet where we have the FEVM active, right? So we have the Filecoin virtual machine, the FEM, and we have the FEVM, the Filecoin Ethereum virtual machine, which is essentially the EVM virtualized on top of the FEM. Now, why do we want to do that instead of just deploying actors straight to the FEM? Well, you know, the EVM is widely adopted across many different blockchains, and there's a ton of robust tooling around that including the tool we're gonna to be using today, uh, Hardhat. Uh, so um, this allows us to take advantage of all that tooling <clears throat> and allow existing Web3 developers to easily come over. <clears throat> and excuse me, my, uh, I had a, <clears throat> a cough. I think the allergies are hitting me. Um, okay, let me just show you real quick. So just an introduction to Hardhat. <clears throat> um, it's essentially a development environment that allows devs to easily from their computer, just write smart contracts in Solidity, test those smart contracts, deploy them to a chain, automate it. We can create tax, tasks to automate our interactions with those uh, 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 smart contracts. Um, and overall, just a very useful tool. There's a couple of other tools. Um, Brownie, if you like to program in Python, Hardhat specifically is in JavaScript. Truffle is another JavaScript, uh, one that a lot of people know from Consensus. And um, we have Foundry, which is kind of the newcomer, but seems to be gaining some steam. You know, we'll, I'll switch over to my VS code. So um, here's what I, um, on the left here, you kind of see what a hard hat project looks like. Um, just a quick overview. We have our contracts directory where we'll write any of our smart contracts in Solidity. Um, deploy. So we're to use a hard hat and deploy to a chain, <clears throat> you need to write a specific deploy script to tell it which contracts you want to point to and where you want to deploy them. And so here we have a simple JavaScript deploy script. We'll go over it in a bit. Um, deployments, which just gives you um, some metadata on where your contracts that have already been deployed are deployed. Um, node modules, if you're familiar with that, um, you know, pretty self-explanatory, NPM, or yarn node modules. And scripts and tasks. Um, so these are where we can write things that we want to automate. Tasks are a little bit more built in with hard hat, so we can just call, we can commit type in the command hard hat and then put whatever task we want in and it'll automatically run. Scripts are just like anything else that might not work super well with hard hat. Right now we do not have any. Uh, we just got this demo done uh, yesterday and the FEVM is still um, a work in progress. So, you know, you can find the release schedules for that online. Uh, but for now, um, we'll be interacting with our contract using curl and just contacting the RPC uh, directly. And 
The other important file I want to point out is the hardhat config.js. So this is where we can customize uh, our hardhat and tell what we want out of it and where we want to point it to. So you'll see here, we're pointing it to the Wallaby testnet <clears throat> where we have the FEVM deployed. And we've defined the RPC URL for uh, Wallaby and um, a private key that we're going to be working with. Of course, I always have to tell this, I know people here probably already know, never show your private key, um, probably keep it hidden in an environment variable somewhere, make sure you don't check it in to get just to be safe. Uh, I always like to put that disclaimer in. Um, okay, so yeah, if we, so we have it all pointed to already to Wallaby. If we come here and we look at the deploy script, it has some requirements for some built-in, um, some hard hat requirements and um, a couple of file coin things. So it understands file coin language. And essentially it's just gonna call this RPC and send a post request um, to say, hey, we have this contract, let's send over the bytecode and deploy it. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go ahead and deploy that. So I'm gonna type in MPX hardhat deploy. And this is gonna take a little bit of time while the um, deployment interacts with Wallaby and Wallaby confirms it. Um, so we'll use that and I'll look at the solidity code and explain it real quick. You'll see, let's see, I'm gonna try to get this a little bit bigger. There we go. Um, we have what our Ethereum just would be, you know, if we were acting on the EVM, but underneath that, since this is on the FVM, we have the file coin addresses associated. Um, particularly, we're gonna be looking at this F0 address later. So um, it's deploying, let's look at simplecoin.soul. So essentially this is just a uh, Solidity contract. It's like a very basic version of what an ERC-20 token may be, very dumbed down, you know, just for demo purposes. And you'll see we just have a simple mapping here for balances, a transfer event that gets emitted, um, and a constructor that assigns us 10,000 simple coins uh, when we deploy it. Um, and then we have a uh, function to send coins and two other functions to uh, check balances at addresses. We are going to be using the get balance in ETH um, function in a bit to see what our balance is. Um, okay, so it is deployed and we have an address uh, right here. This is going to be important in a second. We're going to need that. Um, so yeah, we're going to go ahead and interact with it. Go to my terminal here. So this should give you some more views. You'll see where I was already kind of messing with this earlier. And we're going to get this uh, curl script here. So we're going to actually, just testing to make sure it worked. Um, you'll see it came back with nothing here. Um, and that's because we need to point it at our contract that where it's deployed. Um, and we're going to need to tell it uh, our account, right? That F0 account. Um, so if we come here in the to field, this is where we're going to put uh, our deployed contract address, the 432. And in our data, our from is coming from our address, our deployer address. And in the data field here, you wanna make sure that this is also the deployer address, which it is. Um, and all this other data is like the function selector, which is essentially a, um, like taking some of the hashes of the, the function signature and putting it together. This is like a, all EVM standards, right? So now if we send it, awesome. So in the results, you'll see this 2710, and that's just hex. Uh, if you convert it to decimal, that's 10,000. So we've deployed that contract, the constructor went through, and it showed us that we have 
10,000 simple coin um, in our account. Um, and you'll see that like, this is a very simple demo for now, but the, the FEM is really coming to, to life. Like this is what's so exciting about this. Um, and a lot more features will be coming online. I hope to put this starter kit up and make it available uh, for everyone to mess around with and um, hopefully have some more tasks and stuff on there. So you won't have to be using curl to interact with the, the JSON RPC directly. Um, so yeah, I think that puts us right to time. Thanks so much. Perfect. Thanks so much, Zach. Thank you everyone for attending the mother of all demo days and thank you to all of our presenters. If anyone's interested in presenting, the next demo day will be November 1st and I will get that recording posted um, as soon as possible. Thanks everyone.